Good afternoon. I'm Mark Stepanik. I'm a partner with Taft, Satinius, and Hollister in the Cincinnati office. I do labor and employment law. Thank you for joining us today for HR Profiles webinar, the topic of which is how much is too much? Medical leave, attendance policies, and the interactive process under the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended. Now, like all such presentations, this is not specific legal advice. If you have specific questions, be sure to consult your counsel, or you can find us on the World Wide Web. Understanding what is required under the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended and what it allows is more important now than ever before. We all know that more people are now given protected disability status than at any time in history, and this is because the ADA was amended a few years back to dramatically lower the standard for qualifying as a person with a disability that has to be accommodated in the workplace. So why is that important? Well, it's, impo it's important because all of those folks who are now disabled, who previously were not considered disabled under the law, may be entitled to participate in the interactive process, and consequently, they may be entitled to an accommodation. And if they are, that accommodation may blow up your time and attendance policy. So it's very important to understand how the ADA, the FMLA, interfaces with your time and attendance rules. I have noticed that some of our clients are particularly mesmerized by the Family and Medical Leave Act. In other words, they spend all their time trying to determine eligibility whether the particular condition is a, a serious health condition that would qualify under the FMLA, uh, and whether a leave uh, is appropriate. And they do this to the exclusion of analyzing the situation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. A number of employers have found out the hard way that the FMLA is a floor and not a ceiling to how much leave a person is entitled to. Some. Uh, employers have discovered that the hard way that uh, once they end medical leave at 12 weeks because the FMLA is exhausted that they nevertheless had accommodation obligations under the ADA and if they didn't engage in the interactive process and didn't offer those accommodations they could end up on the wrong side of a lawsuit. Um, well how has this phenomenon manifested itself? Well, as this chart uh, indicates, um, in the last five years, uh, we've seen a dramatic uptick in the number of ADA or disability charges filed with the EEOC. EEOC's published raw data indicates that the number of disability charges filed, as well as the percentage of disability charges as a function of all the charges filed, continues to rise at a significant rate. As you can see from this graphic, uh, back in 2008, um, there were 17,000 plus uh, ADA charges filed, which represented one-fifth of all the charges filed. In 2012, that figure was up to one-quarter of all the uh, charges filed and had increased in number by 50 percent to 26,000 plus charges. Um, and the reason for this is obvious. More people now are qualified as a person with a disability under the ADA, and they can uh, more likely bring a successful charge. We used to bat these charges out pretty easily by uh, arguing and proving that the person was not disabled. With the ADA AA amendments, they lowered that bar, and many, many more people are now disabled than were before in the eyes of the EEOC. Now, the biggest and most surprising trend that we've uh, experienced lately is the, an attack on the very idea that attendance is somehow important. Uh, you know, Woody Allen once famously said that 80% of life is just showing up, but the EEOC believes that showing up is not even necessary for most jobs. Let's look at whether or not attendance is an essential job function. Uh, probably the, the scariest case in this area is pending before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appear Appeals, which sits here in Cincinnati and involves the EEOC and the Ford Motor Company case. 
Um, in that case, um, EEOC argued to the Sixth Circuit that regular attendance is no longer an essential function of most jobs. Um, the EEOC argues that case authority to the contrary, and there's quite a bit of it, is outdated because it predates recent technological advances that allow people to telecommunicate and work from home and the widespread use of the internet to perform most jobs. Now this case is still pending, so we don't know whether or not uh, the EEOC is going to prevail or not, but here are the basic facts which I think illustrate um, uh, this issue. These are the facts in the EEOC versus Ford case. The employee suffered from irritable bowel syndrome, and as a result, she perhaps understandably sought to work from home whenever she had a flare-up. Well, the problem was the flare-ups could uh, be anywhere uh, up to four days per week and often without notice. So what she asked Ford uh, for the uh, right to do was to work at home up to four days a week and without any prior notice to the company. Uh, Ford argued that telecommuting uh, to work was not a reasonable accommodation for her position. She served as a steel buyer, which meant that she was buying uh, raw steel for a Ford Motor to use in the construction of automobiles. And Ford argued that she needed to regularly interact with uh, her team members and fellow buyers. EEOC countered that face-to-face -face interaction among employees on a team is a mere employer preference and that an employer preference should be given no weight when analyzing an ADA uh, claim. Uh, the EEOC argued further that the essential functions of a job, which we all know uh, disabled persons are not able to shed the essential functions, but they said essential functions relates only to the duties performed and not to the location of where those duties are performed. And of course, Ford perhaps contributed to its own problem by allowing other non-disabled employees to, to telecommunicate in other jobs. In other words, when EEOC was looking at this charge and trying to decide whether telecommuting was a reasonable accommodation for this particular charging party, uh, when they saw that Ford had allowed other non-disabled people, perhaps in different job classifications, but nevertheless, to telecommute and work from home, they said that that was evidence that telecommuting is a reasonable accommodation. Well, for now, EEOC's radical view uh, in this EEOC v. Ford case is a minority view, and it's not necessarily the law. When the Sixth Circuit finally rules on this case, it will be the law in Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, and Tennessee, and no doubt persuasive authority in other jurisdictions. So what should you do? Uh, well, one of the issues, of course, in the Ford case uh, had to do with occasional absences in telecommuting. So you should check your job descriptions. Do your job descriptions say, appropriately, uh, that uh, attendance is an essential job function, that good attendance is an essential job function. If it doesn't say that specifically, and, and certainly for years this seemed almost axiomatic, why would you say that in a, in a job description? Well now there's good reason to say it if it's true because its absence may suggest to the EEOC that it's not an essential function. And then you should also consider whether your telecommuting uh, policies are working against you. Now we're not recommending that you eliminate as a matter of policy telecommuting, but you at least need to understand that when you do allow it, you're going to make it easier for persons to claim that telecommuting in their job is a reasonable accommodation. So now of course in this case you were talking about sporadic absences up to four days a week. What is the law uh, currently and how is it developing with respect to extended absences. Um, well, one thing we've seen is that employers have paid out millions of dollars because of inflexible leave policies. And some of the most notable cases involve Super Value and Jewel Osco, who agreed to pay $3.2 million uh, under a consent decree uh, in litigation brought by the EEOC in 2011. Well, what problem did they have? Well, they had a policy that said if you were out on medical leave, you could not return unless you were 100% recovered or had a, quote, full release, close quote. And the only accommodation they offered to folks who had disabilities was an extended medical leave. 
and they didn't consider other uh, possible uh, accommodations. The EEOC contended, uh, and, and apparently the company ultimately relented because there was a consent decree, they contended that this violated uh, the employer's obligations to engage in an interactive process and offer reasonable accommodations where necessary. Similarly, in Sears Roebuck Company, they agreed to pay $6.3 million under a consent decree in 2009. That was, at the time, the largest ADA settlement in history. I say at the time because you're about to see there's been an even bigger one uh, lately. Um, and what did Sears do? Basically, Sears said that if you went out on workers' comp leave and you reached maximum medical improvement, um, they would end your employment without consideration of other possible reasonable accommodations. So in other words, uh, they were employing, these companies were employing hard and fast limits, uh, regardless of length, on uh, the amount of leave that they would offer employees. Now, these are big companies with sophisticated human resource functions. We speculate that they did this because they probably have thousands of employees on leave at any one time. And what the EEOC wants you to do, of course, is engage in the interactive process, which is an individualized decision making, which, of course, is very difficult when you've got lots of employees on leave. EEOC's position in these cases is that if you have a set period, maximum period for leave, no leave shall be longer than, let's say, 12 months, that you have, by definition, precluded the interactive process. And they actually may be on to something. You think about it. An employee brings in a doctor's note, and this is a hypothetical, so it doesn't have to necessarily make sense, but an employee brings in a doctor's note that says, please excuse Joe from work. He's having this particular uh, medical procedure. He's disabled, and he's going to be out 53 weeks. Well, what if your policy said no leave can exceed 52 weeks? What EEOC would say is that the accommodation under that fact pattern isn't whether or not it's reasonable to give somebody 53 weeks off. That seems like a long period of time. The accommodation in that case is whether or not you have to give them that additional one week from 52 to 53. So in that case, the employer would find itself in the nearly impossible situation of arguing well, of course we could give Joe 52 weeks off, but how could we possibly be expected to give him 53 weeks off? All right, so that's the analysis. When you have a fixed leave period, the question is, is additional leave beyond that a reasonable accommodation? And you only know that if you engage in the interactive process. Now, I, I told you that the Sears case was eclipsed in terms of being the largest settlement uh, in uh, EEOC history. The, uh, in 2011, in Verizon agreed to pay $20 million to settle a nationwide EEOC disability suit. Uh, according to EEOC, Verizon had denied reasonable accommodation to employees and disciplined them or fired them pursuant to a no-fault attendance plan. <clears throat> well, lots of us have no-fault attendance policies, and of course we know that the FMLA played havoc with those because if the person qualifies for FMLA leave, you can't apply your no-fault attendance policy. Well, EEOC is, is following suit saying that, well, wait a minute, if the person is disabled, and remember, many more people are disabled now than used to be disabled in the eyes of EEOC, that if you're applying that no-fault attendance policy to somebody who's missing work because of a disability, you might be discriminating against them. What's the cure? The cure is you have to engage in the interactive process. You have to meet with the employee, discover what accommodation they may need, and decide whether or not flexing your attendance policy is a reasonable accommodation. <clears throat> now, be careful. We're not saying that flexing your attendance policy is always, and in every case, a reasonable accommodation and that you must do so. But what I am saying is that you need to engage in the interactive process if you're about to terminate or discipline somebody who is disabled, who didn't come to work because of their disability under your no-fault attendance policy. Here's exactly what EEOC has to, to say about this. The EEOC has issued guidance on disability, and it says, and I quote, and it's laid out here on the screen, if an employee with a disability needs additional unpaid leave, 
as a reasonable accommodation, the employer must modify its no-fault policy to provide the employee with the additional leave unless the employer can show, in other words, the employer has the burden of proof, that there is another effective accommodation that would enable the person to perform the essential job functions of the position. So, for example, <clears throat> um, the person, rather than needing leave, you know, we remove a non-essential function or we get them a chair or we lower the height of the table they're working on, allowing to, them to telecommute, move to a vacant position, that sort of thing. Or, unless the employer can show that granting additional leave would cause an undue hardship. Well, as you know, as HR professionals, that the employer bears the burden of proof on showing an undue hardship. An undue hardship is judged under very, very rigid standards that takes into consideration the resources, the total resources of the company, and it's very difficult to show an undue hardship in many cases. <clears throat> now, if, if, um, not grant, or if, if granting this additional leave would put a undue burden on other employees, that sometimes can be proved to be an undue hardship. But what I'm telling you is that this is a case-specific analysis from which the only general rule you can derive is that if you're about to discipline somebody under a, a leave policy, maximum leave policy, or no-fault attendance policy, and that person is disabled, you must engage in the interactive process. Um, and that's what's required here. Engaging in the interactive process, making some sort of individualized assessment. Now, we're not saying that limitless leave is required. What we're saying is that an inquiry is required into what is needed and how the person might be accommodated. A quick word or two about substance abuse. You all know that <clears throat> current illegal drug use is not protected under the ADA. The federal government made a policy decision that said we're not going to accommodate current illegal drug users because we're trying to stamp out illegal drug use. But alcoholism is protected and also former drug use. Somebody who you know was a, a heroin abuser a year or two ago who now works for you, that person's history of drug abuse would be protected if they're not a current user. Well, oftentimes when employees show up at work drunk, uh, rather than being fired, the employer will offer a rehab opportunity and some sort of last chance agreement. Um, finally, some good news. There are some recent cases that have held that a return to work agreement, in other words, basically a, a, a little contract with the employee that says rehab me and I'll stay clean when I come back, um, can be enforced against the employee without running afoul of uh, the ADA. The, uh, some courts have held that violation of a return to work agreement is not the same as terminating for disability. So the person's an alcoholic, they show up at work drunk, you could fire them for that. Uh, they ask to be rehab, or you offer them rehab, they agree, they sign your return to work agreement where they say they're not going to show up for work uh, under the influence again. They violate that. Terminating them at that point, uh, these courts have held, is not the same as firing them for their alcoholism. It's firing them for violating their return to work agreement. Um, likewise, courts have held that failing to complete treatment can justify a termination. So the person says, please boss, give me another chance, let me go to rehab, they don't finish the rehab. Can you then terminate them? Yes, you're not terminating them for being an alcoholic or a former drug abuser, you're terminating them for their failure to complete the treatment. Now be careful, you can't go too far. You'll see on the screen a bullet point that says uh, driver no return policy unlawful. In this particular case, the employer was a trucking company the employee came forward and said, well, I have an alcohol problem. The employer and uh, seemingly uh, uh, generously said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll let you go to rehab and we'll find you another job, but you can never drive uh, for us again. And the EEOC and the court said that uh, that was a violation of uh, the law, that the never drive again policy uh, was going a step too far. Uh, other courts have upheld uh, that uh, where an employee has detectable amounts of alcohol in their blood during a required drug test, that the employer can take action on that without uh, being accused of uh, discriminating against the employee because of his alcoholism. Well, what else uh, do you need to know? A couple of things. Number one, 
This is very important. Indefinite leave is not a reasonable accommodation. In other words, if an employee comes to you and says, after some reasonable period of time for medical assessment, and says, I need a medical leave and I don't know how long I'm going to be out. Uh, most courts have held that that is not a request for a reasonable accommodation. That indefinite leave, a leave with no known end date, is different than a request for leave for a specific period of time that's beyond perhaps what your policies otherwise uh, would allow. So let's put this through a hypothetical for illustration purposes. A fellow has a heart attack, he falls down on the ground, and you say to him as you're waiting for the ambulance, when will you be coming back? And he says, I don't know. You can't fire him for, for requesting an indefinite leave. But once the person's been stabilized and his doctor looks at him and the doctor says, you know, he can come back in six or eight weeks, that would be, uh, or let's say 13 weeks, to get to take the FMLA out of the picture. Um, the, the interactive process would be, can I accommodate this guy by giving him leave for 13 weeks? If after some reasonable period, on the other hand, the doctor says this guy's condition seems to be permanent, I don't know if he's ever coming back, then the law uh, says in most jurisdictions that that's something you would not have to accommodate. Likewise, if you offer employees as a reasonable accommodation light duty, light duty is different than removing non-essential functions. Light duty means in most, uh, in the common vernacular means actually removing essential functions. Uh, from a job, which you're not required to do under the ADA, um, that you don't have to offer that forever. So if you've got a disabled employee and you say, well, look, until you get back on your feet, we're going to, you, you don't have to do this, that, and the other thing, these three parts of your job. Uh, having offered that, you don't have to continue that forever. Likewise, uh, extension of a request for some short-term disability need not be indefinite. So when the employee says, I need six months off, and you determine that that's a reasonable accommodation, um, and then he comes back and he says, I need more time off, if it's a specific period of time, you go through the interactive process to determine if that's reasonable. If it's indefinite, then you don't have to agree to that. Well, of course, many plaintiff's lawyers and lots of their doctors have figured out, well, here's the trick is, is you don't ask for an indefinite leave because that's not a reasonable accommodation. So you ask for a specific leave and then you just keep rolling it over. He needs three months off. And then at the end of three months, he needs another three. And at the end of that, he needs another three. So what's the law on that? Um, well, even the EEOC has said that the employer can, in, a con in that uh, context, uh, request of the treating physician information about why his first estimate was inadequate or inaccurate and couldn't be relied upon. Um, the, uh, most courts will uphold, after you've gone through one or two of these iterations, the idea that, hey, this rolling leave is really nothing but indefinite leave in disguise and does not need to be accommodated. Well, we've talked a lot about the interactive process. Uh, let's go over some key points of that. Uh, first, some courts, and this isn't true of every jurisdiction, but some courts have said that you have to distinguish between conduct and a manifestation of the disability. So for example, a guy is sleeping on the job. If he's sleeping on the job because he's narcoleptic, in other words, he falls asleep and he can't control it and that's due to uh, uh, a problem with his brain, um, that sleeping on the job in that instance is a manifestation of his disability. And firing him for sleeping is the same thing as firing him for being narcoleptic, which you're not allowed to do. Now, of course, if not being asleep at work is an essential function, and probably is for most jobs, but certainly for, let's say, air traffic controller or security guard, it's going to definitely be a, an essential function, then uh, the person simply isn't qualified for their job. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have to consider other accommodations, which could be a medical leave of absence if a medical leave is going to do any good. In other words, you don't have to give somebody a medical leave of absence if, at the end of it, they're going to have the exact same problem or considering them perhaps for some other position where this narcolepsy problem wouldn't be as critical. Um, the second bullet point talks about adjustment to medication. Uh, there was a, a rather unusual case where a person uh, was getting psychoactive drugs for a psychiatric problem. They came to work one day uh, with, uh, believe it or not, raw meat 
and some beer, and the employer uh, thought that inappropriate and fired him. And the court, believe it or not, found that, he, that the company failed to reasonably accommodate that fellow. And the reason was that his bizarre behavior with the meat and the beer was a manifestation of, his, uh, of, the, uh, of the drugs, manifestation of the disability compounded uh, by a, a bizarre uh, interaction with the drugs, and that he should have been given medical leave in time to get his meds under control. So how could that problem have been cured? It could have been cured through the interactive process rather than just blowing him up when he showed up acting uh, uh, unusual at work. They should have sat him down and tried to figure out what the deal was and then considered whether a leave was possible. Um, the third bullet point talks about a failure to advise of vacancies. In this particular case, a woman was a cancer sufferer. She came to work, said, I don't think I can do my job anymore. It's just too physical and the chemo and the cancer is wiping me out. And the employer said, well, okay, fine, then we'll accept your resignation. She later sued and the court said that what the company should have done was engaged in the interactive process and reviewed with her uh, other vacant positions that perhaps she could have done. And so that was a failure to engage in the interactive process. Similarly, similarly on that last bullet point, um, uh, it's the same case. Um, in that instance, the, um, the woman's physician had sent in a letter saying that she needed all of these different accommodations, and the employer read it and said, well, we can't do that. And so they just terminated her when the court ultimately said what they should have done was sat down with her and gone through the list of suggested accommodations and said, well, we can do one and three, but not two and five, and maybe we can do four, and that would have been the interactive process. Having failed to do that, they set themselves up for um, potential legal liability. So to sum up, as you can see, under the new and vastly more liberal ADAAA, you're going to have a lot more people who qualify as disabled, and as a result, you're going to have a lot more chances uh, to get hung up on the ADA. So here are the takeaway tips. Number one, never, ever apply a limit on leave. In other words, somebody that says leaves are limited to six months, 12 months, whatever, without engaging in the interactive process. If you discover from the interactive per process that the person needs a much longer leave, perhaps you can't accommodate it. Uh, if they need an indefinite leave, you don't have to accommodate it. But if they need an additional short leave, you at least have to uh, have engaged in the interactive process so you can show that you could not accommodate it. Uh, number two, if somebody does ask for additional leave that you cannot accommodate, you must consider other accommodations. In other words, well, we can't give you another 10 months off. You've already been out for a year, but we do have this position over here that's available. Doesn't mean you have to offer them a position, but it means you have to go through the list of, of available positions to determine whether or not that is a reasonable accommodation. The failure to engage in the interactive process is where you're going to get hurt. And then number three, as you engage in the interactive process, do that with a witness and document your efforts in the conversation. If the employee is telling you, well, there's nothing I could do, I can't do that job, I can't do this job, I don't know when I'm coming back, document all that, and you should be okay. Hopefully this was helpful. If you have any questions, let us know. Thank you very much.